Hi, everyone. My name is Jackie Gifford, and I am the Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure. Thank you for joining me today. We're going to be talking about how three different destinations are coping during the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining me are three key stakeholders. We have Graham Davis, the President of Baja Mar, Ken Roy Herbert, the Chairman of the Anguilla Tourist Board, and Helen Hill, the CEO of Explore Charleston. We have Graham Davis, the President of Baja Mar. Graham, how are you? Uh, we're excellent, uh, Jackie. Everyone's staying well. Happy New Year, and thank you very much for the invitation. Can you just set the scene for us? How is Baja Mar coping right now? How are you doing? How is your team doing? Well, this has been an unprecedented time for us here in the Bahamas. We closed our doors March 25th of 2020, uh, and we knew we had to uh, make significant changes uh, to how we were operating and how we were taking care of our associates and being ready to reopen again as we've done on December 17th. Uh, it's very important that we take care of our associates first. Uh, since the time that we have closed, uh, we've been uh, paying our associates to stay home, be safe uh, for nine months. Uh, we've spent uh, over $70 million in ex gratia payments and medical benefits and paying our associates that we're working to stay on uh, throughout these times. We've been working closely with the government of the Bahamas who have done an exceptional job at keeping the country safe. 350,000 people in the Bahamas throughout the archipelago uh, with lockdowns, uh, with uh, important testing to ensure that uh, we create a safest environment. And we're very pleased that we were able to reopen our doors, but we knew that we had to uh, change uh, the landscape on how we do business each and every day as we reopen on December 17th. Along with the health visa program that the Bahamian government has put into place for guests to test five days prior to arrival uh, with the health visa, which includes insurance in case something should happen to medevac our guests out, uh, we also put in additional protocols uh, to test our guests uh, upon arrival at the resort, which is really unprecedented for most uh, resorts or businesses around the globe. We're testing every guest. We've done over now 20,000 tests since we've opened December 17th. And I can tell you that we've had a positivity, positivity rate of 0.01 or one-tenth of 1%. One uh, so it's been very successful. We've been testing our associates on a weekly basis as well. Uh, and we are the first resort, uh, or one of the first probably hotels in the world that is offering uh, rapid antigen tests or PCR tests to actually go back home. So we're creating an environment uh, that is as seamless uh, and, is, and as easy as possible for our guests to enjoy an exceptional experience at Baja Mar. I think what's, what, what you've done is really, really been ahead of the curve when it comes to testing. So I, everyone's been reacting to the news that now going forward, Americans or anybody entering the United States internet from international um, on an international flight has to test before before going back. And I think you are going to be in a key in a good position to be able to provide that service to your guests. So I guess to your point, not every resort was doing this. You're now you were doing it already. The one thing too, I want to point out to, to viewers is you actually are also doing a phased opening. So talk to me a little bit about that. Well, we wanted to ensure that we open safely uh, and uh, successfully as well. So it was important to uh, build that consumer confidence as quickly as we could. And that was to open our Grand Hyatt first. Uh, and we did that when we opened the project to begin with. We opened in a phased manner. Uh, to ensure that we had all of our protocols uh, in place that were uh, worked out thoroughly ahead of time and to execute on it flawlessly, which we've done. And so uh, we felt that once we're comfortable that the Grand Hyatt uh, can open with our casino, all of our shops and, and uh, many of our restaurants and, and all of our other amenities, that we could successfully ensure that the protocols were being maintained uh, flawlessly that our sanitization program was in place, uh, that the service levels were exceptional in every way, uh, we then can start looking at opening up our other properties. 
And we're expecting to open those uh, in March in less than 50. We're now 51 days away uh, from, from opening up, uh, we hope, the SLS and our roads with Bahamar as well. Uh, so this is the thoughtful and certainly uh, the safest way uh, to open successfully. You mentioned to the idea of being outdoors, and that's one advantage that the Bahamas has is so much of the culture there and the lifestyle is outdoors. Are you creating new outdoor experiences for guests in light of the, the pandemic? Well, we, we certainly are um, offering our experiences, uh, whether it be uh, our uh, excursions uh, out on, on boats to the nearby islands, uh, obviously, they're, they're uh, small and, and luxury and, and intimate in, in those ways that it's safe. Uh, we're, we're offering some great experiences, of course, uh, for alfresco dining. Uh, we have more patio space out there. Our pool areas, we have seven pools for Hyatt alone. Uh, and so that we've, we've created some great physical distancing around the pool areas. We have touchless, um, many touchless uh, technology available. Uh, we don't uh, have room keys here at the property. We, uh, we were ahead of the curve in, in that as well, that we have wristbands uh, that every uh, guest has that has an RFID uh, chip embedded. And in those uh, rubberized wristbands that they can wear in the pool, the beach, uh, that opens your room key, your room uh, door, uh, uh, touchless. Uh, and you can also charge, uh, you don't have to sign checks, you don't have to touch uh, any uh, pens or, or anything. It's just a, a touch of the wrist uh, to a tablet and you're paying uh, for all your, uh, your food and beverage and experiences as well. QR codes are, are easily uh, accessible at all of our outlets. Uh, we have QR codes we have for our app that you can download and have everything available. Booking, excursions and golf can all be done right from your own phone. So uh, touchless technology has been in the forefront of our minds since prior to COVID. And we're continuing to evolve uh, through COVID as well. Thank you. Thank you, Graham Davis, President of Bahamar, for joining me today. I'm Jackie Gifford, Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure, and we're continuing on with the evolution of travel, how destinations are adapting to a new era. With me now is Kenroy Herbert, the Chairman of the Anguilla Tourist Board. Hi, Kenroy. How are you? Hi, Jackie. I'm doing well. And how are you doing? Well, I'm doing I'm doing pretty great, I have to say. So, uh, full disclosure, I am in Anguilla. I'm I am here, uh, and we're staying socially distanced. It's been fascinating to be on the ground in a new destination, and I want to talk to you about some of the protocols that you've put in place here. So, why did it open a little bit later than other Caribbean destinations? Well, you know, we wanted to get it right. We also wanted to ensure that once we open. It, it, it was sustainable, you know, unlike some of our other neighbors who reopened and then closed, you know, that created uncertainty and frustration for both travel advisors and clients. So we learned from the experiences and we came up with our own template for reopening. So after two weeks in, in, in quarantine or stay in place vacation, as we say, if they're still test negative, they can enjoy our island as we do, enjoying the freedom afforded by our low COVID numbers. Ken Wright, tell me how you, you and the government came up with the testing system you did. So to be clear to everyone, visitors have to take an RT-PCR test. And that, by the way, includes children. Not all destinations are doing that three to five days before they come in. And then on arrival, wait in your facility, in your hotel, your villa, wherever it is, until you get cleared and get those negative results. So tell me a little bit about that, because it is one of the more robust testing systems out there. Yes, so uh, our health professionals led by our CMO, the Chief Medical Officer, you know, they conferred with regional CARPA, PAHO, and international WHO and public health UK agencies in determining the best practices and most effective protocols for Anguilla. So studies reveal that the three testing protocols, sequential testing, had a predictive value rate of 97% in identifying the virus in persons. So this is what we adopted. So visitors are required to submit a negative PCR test three to five days prior to arrival. Upon arrival, they are required to take another uh, PCR test. And on day 10, 
are the 14 um, of their stay in place, they're required to take another test before um, exiting the quarantine period. And once that is negative, they can enjoy all that Angola has to offer. What prompted you as well to create the bubble concept of, of, of approved vendors and what walk people through that and also how these vendors were chosen so that, you know, it's clear, I want to make clear to people, the word quarantine gets thrown out a lot right now, <laughs> which I think confuses guests and people who are about to travel because they think that they actually cannot leave their hotel room. And that is not the case here. So your stay in place concept, yes, you stay, you stay in place, but it's actually a, a whole system of approved vendors. So you're not literally staying in one place. So the tourism bubble concept was designed to allow our visitors, particularly those who are spending less than 14 days on island, to experience our tourism product in a safe manner that protects both themselves and our local residents. So in collaboration with our stakeholders, we put in place a system of guided movements that allows properties to safely offer their short term stay guests, access to a variety of approved amenities, services, and activities while they stay in place. The properties would submit their proposed activities and uh, respective protocols, which were then inspected and approved by our health officials. So also advanced reservations are required for all activities with transportation provided by certified ground transportation operators. So this means that visitors to Angola can indulge in their favorite, you know, pastimes. Anguilla has been through a lot. I was here just after Hurricane Irma when the island basically had to rebuild. Oh, wow. There were a lot of closures and, and, you know, the island has been through events like this before, but, but in an, on another level, there's COVID. So tell me, how does a destination does rebuild? How, do, how does it do, do situations from the past give you experience for the future and dealing with the pandemic? So we shifted from a tourism economy to a construction economy after Hurricane Irma, but this is not the case with, with this pandemic. When we closed our borders in March, you know, there was no one here. I think this was probably the first time in our history where we had zero arrivals to Angola. And also for an extended period, I think it was uh, what about nine to 10 months. And I must say our government extended the necessary social safety net in terms of unemployment assistance as the tourism sector is by far our largest source of employment here on, on Angola. One of the ways you've gotten creative too is by uh, coming up with a long-term residency program. Could you could you explain a little bit about that? I know other destinations have done something similar, where you know uh, basically remote work visas. This is a big trend that we're seeing in the industry. So the remote the, the working from Angola uh, situation, working remotely from Angola has 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 had a tremendous response. Um, Angola represents an extremely attractive option for those who are already working remotely and likely continue to continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Our low COVID status, excellent communication services uh, and exceptional quality of life are all huge incentives that are attracting professionals seeking a less stressful environment and a change of scenery for themselves and their families. You know, we expect the numbers to to grow even further. We are making an outreach to spread the word about the benefits and advantages of working remotely from Angola. Thank you so much again, Henry Herbert, the chairman of the Anguilla Tourist Board. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Jackie. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie Gifford, Editor-in-Chief of Travel and Leisure, and we're continuing on with the evolution of travel, how destinations are adapting to a new era. And with me today is Helen Hill, the CEO of Explore Charleston. Hi, Helen, how are you? Hey, it's so good to see you. It's great, great to see you too. I wanna to dive right in and just say that Charleston is a city that is big on food and celebration. So how have your restaurants, your small business, has been affected by the pandemic and how are they adapting? Well, Jackie, as you know, you know, dining is so much more than, you know, what we put in our mouth. You know, it's the sights and the sounds and the 
amazing smells. And, you know, I don't think I've ever been more proud of our small businesses. You know, we always hear that like small business is the backbone of America, but we felt it in a different way. You know, our restaurateurs have done things like gourmet meals to go and, you know, taken a parking lot and turned it into like a magical, you know, dining room. So they've just been so innovative in every possible way. Um, and it's really let us know what their employees mean to them that they're working so hard to keep them. The other thing, you know, about food and just again, celebration in Charleston, it's, it's, it's a city that has grown over the years. You've increased your airlift. And because of all these things, right, because of these amazing small businesses, but I, I suspect and I, I see this happening to other destinations, you've also really become a huge, huge drive mark right now because people are wanting to just hop in their cars and do something that's close by. So has your visitor profile changed a little bit since oh. the began? Absolutely. And we've been really fortunate that we've been able to stay mostly open and it's been really fun to welcome um, our visitors from our neighboring states at our newly renovated visitor center um, that we've just opened during the pandemic. Um, we've, it's been so much fun to talk to folks from North Carolina that say like, oh, I haven't been here in four or five years and Charleston looks wonderful. So it has been really fun for us. How do you explain what all your hotel partners have done to keep people safe? whether it's, you know, extra sanitation measures put in place, you know, wearing masks and gloves in restaurants. How does that, how do you explain that to people in a way that also doesn't feel off-putting? I think that's the real challenge right now for tourism professionals is that when you, when you walk people through, they want to know that they're going to be safe, but they also don't want it to feel as if it's a completely different, radically different experience that they know. Well, one of the things we found out is that the average citizen doesn't know already the advanced protocols that hotels and restaurants go um, through to keep visitors safe on a regular basis. It's, it's also interesting from a hospitality perspective, something that we used to keep in the background in terms of making sure the space was so visually beautiful when they walked in the door. Now having someone wipe down the door before you come in is, is a sign of we're caring for you too, right? To have someone right there. So really it's been, you know, making sure that our members are doing a good job educating visitors when they arrive about knowing they have to wear a mask, um, helping them understand through the social media channels um, what they can expect um, and really how to act. The culture too of Charleston, it's a, it's a place that is about outdoor living. It's a pedestrian city as well. So are there new attractions or things like you said, you know, mentioned earlier, a restaurant owner turning a parking lot into a, a dining space right. have been able to change and adapt this past year? And, and are you thinking of even opening new outdoor attractions in the future? Well, you know, one thing we've learned, Jackie, is I think we took our outdoor living for granted. I mean, Charleston, we've always been an indoor outdoor, you know, whether it's on our piazza and our beautiful historic gardens, taking a stroll along the beach. You know, I don't think that we ever thought about that as a outdoor activity, which the world is looking for to be outside. And we have several new things that we're looking to promote. We've got the International African American Museum coming online that has a great, it's right on the beautiful Charleston Harbor with the indoor outdoor experience. We've got our beautiful new Cypress Gardens. And if you've never been to and in a Cypress Gardens, that is a magical, magical experience. And then we've got the Low Line coming, which is a, a 1.7 mile linear park um, that will open in the next couple of years, which was an old railroad track. So just a lot of those kind of things, helping people get outside. I, I think outdoor living is gonna be something that we embrace. Also, you have beaches nearby that are part of the destination. So do you see people combining maybe a little bit of time in downtown with a visit to the beach to get a, a, a greater um, a greater experience in the outdoors? Oh, absolutely. And it's really been fun to see the experience of um, back to our neighboring states, folks that haven't had a chance to be in Charleston maybe in, in the last several years, you know, being able to bike across the beautiful Cooper River Bridge, you know, on a bicycle and ride to the beach. I mean, just some wonderful things that perhaps people as a visitor didn't think about before. I feel it as a New Yorker, our arts and culture is, is really what keeps 
many of um, many of our cities thriving. And those those artists, those events, those things have been so hard hit. And museums, you know, museums struggled during this time. So what? what is a way forward for some of these businesses how do we keep them going and how do we keep and how do we keep visitors engaged from afar what's been fun to see is to see the innovation at our beautiful gilliard um, auditorium to see the performers that have done things even for children virtually to to bring music into their home everything from learning about jazz. Um, it just has been magic to see that happen. And again, it's probably not the exact same experience that you have in person, but it's a way to keep it alive until we can be together again. Thank you, Helen Hill, the CEO of Explore Charleston. Thank you for joining me.